Morning, Bryce. How'd you sleep? Oh, good. Morning. Well, I'd like to introduce you to the crew and get a plan. If anything starts to fall, get the hell out of the way. <laughs> In true movie-making history fashion. My name is Cuitlahuac Morales Velasquez, but I go by Cui. It's easier for everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin Carl Marx. My name is Alonzo Edwards, and I'm a sculptor on, the, on this project. <laughs> go higher. Hi, I'm cute. <laughs> Thank God you hear a heartbeat. My name is Kirk Starbird, and I'm a sculptor, and I've been in the union for 31 years. On this project, I am the project director. I budget, I plan, I find vendors, I shop. I fill in all the gaps where that we don't have personnel for. OPCMIA stands for Operative Plasters and Cement Masons International Association. The OPCMIA represents plasters and cement masons across the country and the various trade jurisdictions that they perform work in. There's 50,000 members through the United States and Canada. We do heavy and highway. Uh, water treatment plants, nuclear plants. We do commercial buildings. So, you know, the difference between our local, Local 755, is we work in the motion picture industry. We create the stuff that you see on the movie screen and on television. You know, our work is in the background. You see it all the time. It's there. You know, we're creating anything from uh, the Lincoln Memorial to it could be a cave on a big soundstage and everything in between. Other people just can't do what we do. We rely on each other. And it's a system for talented people to be protected and excel at what they do. We are changing the logo of our union. Uh, I, I, I believe they were three males, right, Kirk? Oh, yeah. See that? Well, we're, we're, we're re representing it. There's some change on uh, races. It's been around quite a while and it, was, uh, it wasn't diverse. These are three, it appears to be Caucasian. The old logo's a bunch of old white dudes, how about that? <laughs> we wanna honor our new members and show who's in our union, which are women and men and people of all races. Chuck uh, was contacted by Dan Stepano, our international president and Kevin Sexton, our treasurer. And they asked for us to make a sculpture in the round for the front of our new headquarters building in Columbia, Maryland. So it all started uh, with me contacting Kirk. Kirk is my right-hand man when it comes to sculpture. Uh, so Kirk and I had a conversation. We agreed to uh, bring in uh, Michelle Malay. Uh, from there, we asked Michelle to really start working on that concept drawing. And then from that drawing, we showed it to Dan Stefano, our general president, and it was what he was envisioning. And, you know, he approved it. When sculpture's put out in a gardener outside, it can be easily dwarfed by the environment around it. So a way to solve the visual challenge is to make things over life size. These are 125% of the normal height of a human being. So if a man's six feet, the plaster, for instance, is seven and a half feet tall. I've learned over the years that you really need to make a scale model. We have a lot of people working on this project simultaneously, so we needed a communication device so everybody knew what we were making. We, we may deviate from that model, but it gives us the floor plan. It gives us the basics, so when we go to put the figures on and the table on and the bucket. We all know they're not gonna be bumping into each other. Kirk made a scale model of the armature and then they pulled the numbers off of that and did the math and then they made it full size. 
And then you just literally start coating it with clay, slamming clay on there. Slap it on as hard as you can, get all the air pockets out. So we use different tools for that, like mallets and stuff, and figure out the right proportions, get the clay where you want it to be, generally. And then you kind of whittle down. You start big and then you get small. When I'm sculpting, you know, it's like you get in the zone. So if you're working on a fold, the only thing that you're thinking about is that. The more you try, you try. There's frustration sometimes too. It's like, oh, I cannot get it. Well, what is wrong with it? You're working on it, exploring the piece until it clicks. Oh, this is good. And then you found it. It's like, oh, whew, did it. After you're satisfied with that, that's when the fun really starts. That's when you really start breathing life into the sculpture. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Things are starting to come alive now. This statue, to me, represents a big change. You know, in, in the world, in our union, you know, especially right now, this is a really good time, I think, to represent um, diversity and inclusiveness. So I'm honored to be a part of that. When you see yourself represented in, in a certain way, you know, you just feel more comfortable, you feel more welcome. I feel like people are gonna be inspired to be a part of the union now because they can maybe see themselves in it more. Recently, over the past month and a half with the uh, Black Lives Matter protests, people are tearing down statues. And it's just so coincidental and uh, ironic that we're making a statue of the moment to help correct the problems in society. And uh, I think we're spot on. And we even started this project before all this turmoil went down. And I feel a great validation that we're doing the right thing. For me personally, this project is pretty uh, special. I haven't really had a lot of opportunities to do figurative sculpting, and especially with clay. I mean, we don't use clay very much. So this is a, a really good opportunity to have fun, um, work with some great, great masterful sculptors. And this is my first time being able to show what I can do. This is something that people are gonna go up to and, and touch. Maybe that changes somebody's life. Maybe they realize that they like doing something like that or they want to do something like that and maybe their career takes them in a direction or, or their life takes them in a direction and, you know, maybe some way I can help somebody, you know? That's cool. I like that. We're a union full of sculptors and artists and, you know, plasters and mold makers and I feel like it's important to get it right because it, it represents something so much bigger than us. We feel like it's important to do it justice, do it, give it our best. If you have a strong expression, you give strength to the rest of a piece. Right here between the eyes, there's a lot of little muscles that I worked on because those little muscles is us. We are the little muscles that give strength to the whole thing. They're showing the passion, they're showing the determination and they show the grade. My name is David Cohen. I am a mold maker by trade, and I have been in Local 755 for 32 years. My name is Charlie Ariza. 
I'm a mold maker and I've been in the union since 96. So it's been a while. The process is we take the clay. We divide the clay into mold sections where the mold will come apart. Whoa! Okay. Yeah. Straight up, Jim. Fast. Faster. We're going to spray silicone over the statue after we find our splits. Sometimes it's red, sometimes it's purple. It's just different colors, different catalysts. This green catalyst is made pretty much to leave overnight. But we've, we've added some different additives that to let it kick off quicker, but not as quick as we're real, what we're used to. Right now, my main concern is all of the silicone running down. Yeah, you see, I try to put some on the high spots because the high spots will stay uh, thin compared to the low spots, which will get too thick. And also, where I see some spots, like under the chin or in the ear, try to like uh, stop a bubble from, from staying in there and kind of like brush it out. And then we brush it up till it reaches a certain viscosity to where we, we don't have to tool it anymore and it starts freezing up on us. And then we can just walk away from it, and give it another layer once it's all set and done. On top of the silicone rubber, once it's cured, we add rigid plaster mold pieces to hold everything together, like a big puzzle. So since the silicone is flexible, case is rigid, plaster, it will hold its shape perfectly and make it easy to cast into. Mold making is a very meticulous process and you want everything to come out perfectly. Mold comes out imperfect, your parts come out imperfect. That's pretty much it. Just put it back together and cast it out of whatever we want. Well, today, Saturday afternoon, we called a bunch of the guys over to come in, and uh, we're trying to get a good start on this uh, Mason statue. We already got the other two statues done, and this is the last of the series. We uh, got the forklift and just took the whole body apart, took the legs off, took the arms off. We lifted the body up and got it to the point where we could start shimming it and separating it. So that way, we know where to actually uh, split the mold. And then after that, we're ready for silicone. So it helps to have a bunch of people like this all at once, because as he's shooting it, we have the silicone you know, dripping, and we don't want it to get all over the floor, and it just uh, helps getting it and controlling it. And that way, we get more done at once. I do think that this is a dying process, you know? Back in the day, I mean, everything was, this is how they made everything. I mean, we're talking about, you know, cathedrals. We're talking about uh, all the Roman, you know, columns, everything, the statues, everything was uh, molded and cast and, you know, technology. It's taken a lot, but we're still here. This kind of work and everything I do is rewarding. This one especially, you know, it's got a little place in my heart because of what it represents. This is who we are right here. And that's why being part of this is, it's a big deal. It's, it's an honor. Working with all these guys, call my brothers and my actual brother. They make the day go by quick. They all work hard. It's great. We got a good team here. Nobody wants to work on a Saturday if they can help it. When a crew comes together and they're making it fun, that's golden. It's a positive feeling. You know, everybody gets along. We're all good to each other. We all stick together. It keeps the union strong. The bronze process is 5,000 years old, and it really hasn't changed much. We take the mold and make a wax using the mold. The temperature of the wax is about 180 degrees. We want it just malleable, so it goes around all the mold, and we can put it in with the paintbrush where we have to. The key is to get it 
to touch the outside of the mold so we can capture what the artist had in the original clay. Once the wax is poured, it goes into our wax department and they clean it. So you'll see them heating up dental tools and cleaning up the wax along the seams. If Kirk used a certain tool to make the texture, we use the same tool in wax to create the same texture. So that by the time it gets to the shell room, everything should be the way the artist made it. A good foundry doesn't show itself. If you can see where the foundry worked, frankly, we failed. Because it's a high temperature wax, it's very fragile. If you drop it, it breaks. And usually, if anyone drops it, it's me. The next step is we want to build a shell around the wax. We put it in a slurry, which wets the wax, and then put on sand or silica to build up the thickest we need. We want about half an inch thick, and generally it's like seven or eight dips. It takes about a day for it to dry, so if we're doing eight different dips, it will take eight different days. With the base uh, in this uh, emblem, it's simple. It's like a flat disc. When I was making the base of the model, I decided, well, why, this is an opportunity for us to show that we make moldings in plaster. And we do them in a traditional way. An ancient, it's an ancient art of spinning plaster. And we deserve a nice pedestal to stand on. I'm Tony Cope. I've been uh, a member of Local 755 for the last um, 30 years now. I did the base, which is what we call a spin. So this is the, basically the profile of what the base is. This sits on the table, and then we have a center point, which is this right here. Plaster actually swells. So as you're going over it, the plaster is swelling a little bit, and your metal template is actually cutting the plaster. Timing is everything. This is uh, just 30 minute plaster, so you have basically 30 minutes to uh, get your piece looking good. We just keep on going over and over it until it gets to that point where you just have to stop and say, okay, that is the best it's gonna be, and let's leave it at that. So Kirk brought us a large pattern for the base. We've used that to make a mold uh, using a chemically bonded sand. The difference between an art foundry and a commercial base foundry is we use sand as our main media for our mold making. The benefit of it is how quickly you can do it. We can actually make a sand mold and pour within an hour or two versus a silica mold is a much longer drawn out process. So when we get ready to pour, we'll melt the metal to approximately 2,350 degrees. When you add that molten metal into the mold, you'll have gases that are given off from the sands that are very volatile. So you'll see flames coming out. You'll see a lot of smoking just because of the intense heat. For me, there is some symbolism in this piece that is not necessarily seen right away. The base, 
is made up of three sections, two quarters and one half. But as a circle, we're unified. The circle can be one of the strongest shapes in geometry. So there's some symbolism in that we're all individuals, but we act as a union. Once we had the shell around the wax, then we burned the wax out. The empty shell gets bronze poured into it, and then the shell is removed, leaving what was wax as bronze. Our bronze has a traditional way of melting metal. They use silicon bronze, which is user-friendly. It's mostly copper. And they put their ingot material in a crucible. Crucible is the pot, which is made out of silicon carbide and they start the furnace. The fire circulates around the crucible. They put the ingots in there and they fill that with molten metal. When it's ready, they pull it out with tongs. They set it down, they put it into a shank. A shank is a two-man lift. And then they go over to the molds and start pouring into the cups. So once the ceramic shell is off of the bronze, then it goes into the finishing chasing room. That's where, if there's imperfections in the casting, they'll grind them off. If there's parts to be welded together, that's where they do it. They chase out the weld with grinders and match in our texture that we sculpted in the clay. Well, when Francisco has to fill in a gap and put in artwork, he's so well trained at it that he, he knows exactly what to do because he's done this so many times. So I trust him. Francisco is definitely our best employee. I shouldn't say that, but he's a very good employee. He's been here for 20 plus years and he knows every phase of the process from wax to shell to bronze to finishing, all the way through. So he's an enormous asset for us. And he's very involved in this piece. Francisco's a wonderful person to work with. He's 
He's so good and he doesn't mess around. He's very, very diligent and he's such a great role model. Well, don't hurt, don't kill yourself. It turned out beautiful. When I hear from Kurt that he's happy and he's loving, he made me happy too because we're doing a great job. Damn, Francisco. Beautiful. Nice fit. It'll be beautiful because of you. Yeah, my name's Simon Kongeser. I do patina independently. So we're going to use uh, chemicals and heat to mimic what nature does naturally, but faster. First process is liver of sulfur and we'll put it on. It'll make the piece darker. Then I'll rub it back so that it highlights the texture of the piece and gives it some depth. And then we're gonna do a wash of chromium oxide, which will be a green, and that'll go into the recesses and have some color to complement the orangey brown that the lipopheric is. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. We got the crates loaded on the flatbed truck, and the statue is going to travel across the country now. We're getting ready to pack our bags and get on the plane and fly to Maryland. When I look at this piece, I see workers working harmoniously and taking care of each other and being happy at work and proud of what we do. And uh, it's just wonderful to see it in bronze. That we all deserve. What does a union mean to me for what I do? I, I'll tell you what, I, it, it's everything for me. It's given me everything. Me and my family, everything we have is because of the union. Kind of like I'm about three feet off the ground. Kind of just like walking on a cloud looking at those statues. It represents who we are and what we do for a living. I couldn't be more proud of that. We finally, you know, arrived to the end of this, and here it is. From pounding to just scraping at the very end, it's been a roller coaster, you know, and it's a thank you for everything that the union has done for me. Couldn't say it better than Queen. <laughs> Queen's got a really good way of saying things. <laughs> 200 years from now, this, this thing is gonna be, it's gonna be there. And I had a part in it. Like, we had a part in it. We have a memory, you know, of working together on this. And I just am so grateful to have been a part of it. This, you know, represents thousands of people. And it will represent thousands more after I'm gone. And I get to go to my grave knowing that I was part of making this happen. I don't think we could get this job done without Kirk. He's the architect of all this, so yeah, it wouldn't be done without Kirk. My professors, um, you know, they were so good to me and, and, and looked out for me. And I said, you know, is there anything I can do to repay you? And they said, nope, just pass the knowledge on and uh, do for others what I've done for you. And so this is a, is a philanthropic endeavor. And it's uh, time for all of us to appreciate our gifts and to uh, honor our own.